All right. Hey, uh, Michael Klein. Welcome, yes, to, welcome to the uh, Pickle Tato podcast each thing. What is your middle name? William. So your full name is what? Ronald William Neal. Goodbye, Bill, obviously. Gotcha. It's been Ron, Will, Bill, William, Jedhead, all kinds of different things. So I'm with your friend Mark. At some point, I want to switch chairs with you. Okay. Not today, but when he does it, maybe get the other guys that want to do it too. Okay. Can ask you, you have a bunch of interviewers. Yeah, well, I mean, we can do that right. We can do that now. Um, I don't know how prepared you are, but when we, when we get done, we'll take a break and then come back and flip scripts if you want. All right. It's fine with me. Okay. We can do that if, if you're ready for it. If not, then like you said, we can do it a different time too. All right. So, um, hey, man, the reason I, I wanted to have you come here and talk to you about, you know, your background and stuff, um, I've known you for, I've actually known you a lot longer than I've really known you. And what I mean okay. by that is <clears throat> I've been watching the band you're currently in right now for quite a while, and I've known Mike for quite a while. Um, I've known Billy, I've known the drummer before him, um, of course, I know Dwayne, but I really didn't know you that that much and when i first saw you you were in the back and you were <laughs> <laughs> you would uh i was watching their bus and like you know obviously i like drums and every band yeah. i go to i'm kind of like just peeled to the drums and i'll you know i look and see what the guitar guys are doing the bass guy but i'm usually peeled at the drums right but every time i would look back to you you'd be just staring at people out in the audience and I would look at you and you look at me and I would like turn my head. I'm like, man, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> He's going to kill me. <laughs> so, and then when you, when you took breaks and I talked to all the other people, you know, you were kind of off, you know, by yourself and, uh, you know, I don't know, three or four years, however long ago it was, you know, there was mention, hey, hey, what's up, man? What's up? And that's how it kind of started. I got you. And about six months later, we actually started talking a little bit. And then um, you guys started practicing here. And that's when I, when you really opened up, I'm like, man, I had no idea. <laughs> Michael talked like that. I mean, I've he been was always a coconut been before. <laughs> a coconut. You got to get you got to get cracked before you start talking. Yeah. yeah. So that's. Go ahead. I, I don't remember meeting you at a gig, mm -hmm. but it, I put it all together when we came here for a party. We played a party, and the guys in the band were like, "Yeah, you know him, you know him." And I get here, and then you played drums with us. I'm mm -hmm. like. I know who this. Here we go. Yeah. I know this, but it didn't take long for us to become tight. Sure. It was almost just yep. bam, we're in. Yep. Yeah, and like I said, you know, if I would have known that, you know, I'm a pretty reserved guy myself. You know, so when I see something like that, I don't try to pry, and, and that's how I viewed you. It's like, hey, you just don't want to be talking to nobody. But man, as soon as you started talking, <laughs> yeah, you just, like, man, you gotta shut me up. <laughs> And that's what brought me to, I'm like, man, I got I to gotta have him on here because you got some great <laughs> stories that we've shared. And uh, hopefully you're comfortable enough to, you know, share it with a bunch of people. Uh, but let's start off where, where did you grow up at? I was born in Madison. Madison, Alabama. Alabama. There's not many of so, us. No. In the mid, I'm mid-50s, Bob Jones High, <laughs> graduate 85. And uh, Madison was little, you know. Went to all the churches, you know, three or three or four churches, um, eat one for each denomination. There was no restaurants out there, really. Yes, yeah, night and day now, huh? Oh, yeah. I remember when I first got here back in, well, it was before I moved here. It was probably 2010 is when I started looking at properties up here. And they started talking, it might have even been before that because County Line wasn't nowhere near like it is now. Right. And they just started putting those houses off County Line. And... The realtor I had at the time was trying to steer me. Like, hey, all the all the military yeah. people come here, you know, they really like this area, blah, blah, blah. And I started looking at it and I'm like, this is gonna be a nightmare. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? You're right. I could just You're see right. it, how fast it was growing the infrastructure was just not ready for it. Well, the getting their own school system really changed everything yeah. for Madison. Before that, it was county schools and wasn't that populated and you knew everybody. You went to church with everybody. You went to school with everybody. But I actually didn't go to elementary school in Madison. I went to evangel school off of University Drive. And back then, there was no bus for this school. So there was a carpool of 
about five of us. <laughs> and a couple of us went all the way through. Evangel closed down in sixth grade or something happened. And uh, my parents decided in 79 to get me into public school. And my dad's carpool buddy just moved. They all moved over to the Rainbow Mountain area. So we moved to the Rainbow Mountain area and uh, went to Monrovia. So that's not a real normal path of schooling for a Madisonite. So I went to Evangel, then I went to Monrovia. And at the time, if you were on that 72 line, you could decide to go to Spartan or you could decide mm. to go to Bob Jones. So we were on the south side of 72. So I went to Monrovia <laughs> and then Bob Jones. But I have a lot of friends that went to Spartan. So it seems like I know more people from that time frame for whatever reason, you know. Did your parents grow up here too? No. Are they, are they uh, native to Charlotte? Okay. So Charlotte. What is, brought them here? Like everybody, engineer wasn't tied down in the early 60s, moved to Huntsville. Mm. And I remember all my friends were from somewhere else. All dad's friends were from somewhere else. Because Washington, Michigan, you know, you know, dad graduated as an aerospace engineer from NC State in 62, I think it was. And that's why I love the Wolfpack. Uh, they're kind of my team. I like Auburn too, but I went to Auburn, but Pac's my team. And it's because my dad and my uncle went there. And um, he was the very first aerospace engineering grad from NC State, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Because it was pretty big incentive if you're in college to make good grades because you were going to go to Vietnam if you didn't. And uh, they came up and said, hey, if you'll get a defense-related degree or something that can be used for defense or the Army or space or anything like that, we will not draft you. So he switched to aerospace engineering. I think he was a senior. And um, they just kind of created this discipline mm -hmm. over the summer. They didn't have an aerospace engineering program. They just said, okay, now we got one. We got this professor in. You can finish up. And um, because our last name starts with a C, he was the first one to walk. Okay. So when I was up there one time, I went into the engineering area. And there he is. Very first one. It's kind of cool. It is cool. <clears throat> I mean, engineering school is no joke. No. Obviously, I've never been through it. But um, when I retired out of the military, my first company I went to was a very, very prominent company here with 80% engineers. And you throw this. <laughs> Were you from here? No, not at all. No. I'm Where are you a, from? I'm originally from uh, Northern Kentucky. Okay. But um, I haven't been back there since 91. I got you. So, you know, I'm been, of course, military. I mean, you name it, a state or country, I've probably been there. Right. And um, you ended up here. I ended up here because my last tour of duty was down at Fort Rucker, which is now Nova Cell, which is, you know, stupid. But um, right. I had, I was working down there and I was going to be there for two years before I retired. And they knew I was retiring, so they weren't going to put me with a unit that was getting ready to deploy. So I was like, well. What year was this? Oh, man. Like trying my head here. 2009 <laughs> ish, I think, somewhere around there. Because I, I retired in 11, December of 11. So, you know, 2009-ish or so. And, you know, being in the aviation world, most of my friends, if you weren't a um, a mechanic, like a maintenance test pilot, um, it was, you know, a maintenance test pilot can pretty much go anywhere in any kind of aviation industry. But an instructor pilot for an Apache, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you can go out of helicopters, you know, like flight, you know, paramedic flight. Um, there's a bunch of littler jobs, but... um. Oddly enough, they don't, they pay good, but not as good as I wanted. And um, the industry for Apaches was here in Huntsville. That's where the program management office is at. And that was the reason why I started, I knew I was going to come up here. I didn't know what I was going to do. Right. As a matter of fact, I bought a property and started building a house a year before I retired. Didn't have a job, didn't know anybody, didn't have anything. <laughs> I was just. It felt right. I knew we, you know, I knew we were going to come up here. I just didn't know what we were going to do. I was pretty sure I was going to work with something with Apache, but uh, anyway, that's what that your gotcha. your, your question was. Why I come up here, and that was why um, I didn't start off 
with Apache. It was the farthest thing from Apache, but um, that's what brought me up here. Gotcha. Which a lot of guys do, you know. Yeah, especially this, in the aviation world. Well, I know Huntsville is the area is the place to move to right now, and it's in it's very robust place to live, and it's great. Yeah. But it's been like this for 50, 60 years. Um, you know, I think the whole Operation Paperclip with Warner von Braun, the whole thing. Is amazing how it happened. It came down to one, because they were in Texas. The German scientists were in Texas, and one guy decided, okay, it's going to be Huntsville. So they moved them here, and uh, the rest is history. Literally, you know, mm -hmm. the space program, and then the influx of all the engineers. And at one time, you know, the more PhDs per capita were in Huntsville. And uh, it's very un-Alabama in a lot of ways. It's like a California town kind of stuck here. But mm. I was just talking to a lady at the doctor's office. I mean, it's always been this way. Literally anything you're interested in, anything, is here. There's a group here. There's people that are here that do it, uh, whether it's soccer, fencing, Dungeons and Dragons, backgammon. I mean, you name it. If you can't find like-minded people in this town, then the problem's you, you know? So if it's been like that for 50, 60 years, who let the secret out? Because these past four or five yep. years, it has gone absolutely berserk. I mean, you know, what's that farm place over off 72? Hillcliff Cliff Farms, yeah. Yeah, Hillcliff? Cliff Farms. Cliff Farms. I mean, when I first got there, that was just, obviously, it was right. a farm, and it was... Hundreds of acres out there. I know. I went to church with Jack Clift. I mean, yeah. he was uh, one of the elders at the church, and his grandson lived right across the street from me. And uh, his name was Ernest Kilgore. He passed away a few years ago, and it just seems hard to believe that, you know, that he's gone. He was a good friend, neighborhood friend. But that's what happens when you get older. You start thinking about, you have these flashbacks, you know, of how different it was. How different. Yeah. <laughs> we rode our bikes to Athens one day. Just, you know, we didn't even really get in trouble for it. You yeah. know, it was just something that you could do. And I had friends that lived in Skyline Acres, and we lived in Rainbow Mountain, which is kind of near Slaughter Road, 72. We'd ride our bikes all the way down to Skyline Acres and ride our bikes all the way to Lady Ann Lake, which is now off Zert Road. And it was just, yeah, you can barely find dirt there now. That's like concrete everywhere. It was you know? a, it was a quite a paradox growing up here. I remember the second place we lived was off of Shelton Road, Madison Pike, and uh, you could hear the rockets testing, you know, mm. and it would rattle everything off the walls. So there was that. Then there was the crop dusting because the cotton fields were really close to your house. You know, you'd be out there playing it. All the moms would be like <laughs> yelling. You had to get in the house. Because they didn't care. They were going to crop spray dust Spray whoever's there. <laughs> going to get crop dusted. <laughs> and then there was a horse farm behind the house. So noises and smells, <laughs> just that was sort of the, you know, when I was 8, 9, 10 years old, I remember a lot of that. We didn't even have enough kids to field a Little League team in mm -hmm. Madison. And we had to get kids from Limestone County. So I have friends from Belmona from that time period. You look at the baseball pictures, you're like, you know, everybody on that team, you know, yeah. the old pictures, you know who the coach is. And my dad was, and uh, Ralph Malone's dad, we were, and Mr. Woolwine, they coached everything for all these years for all these kids. So I wonder how many teams are there now. You know oh, what I mean? Man. <laughs> you said you could, you could barely put a team together yeah. back then, but man, there's probably a whole league there now. And my mom was on the rec board and uh, was, instrumental in getting Palmer Park done. So not so coincidentally, my first job was mowing grass at Palmer Park before it was Palmer Park. That was my first job. Yep. I was about seven or eight. Believe it or not, I actually drove a bush hog. I know I can't do anything mechanical in the least right now, but yeah. back in the day, I could drive a tractor yeah. and do a bush hog and all that stuff. Hey, man, that's a good uh, skill to know. So <clears throat> elementary, you said the, uh, the elementary closed up at sixth grade, I yep. think? And then you went to Monrovia. to Monrovia. So going through middle school and high school, um, we're going to get into your background as All far right. as music, music stuff. I mean, when when did you start first picking that up or what, what sparked your interest? Was it a band? Was it a certain type of music? Or Yeah, both. Um, somewhere in the childhood, I had guitar lessons. And I was mm. terrible. And there was a music store right west of Sparkman Drive in the Woolco Shopping Center. 
And I took lessons there for a while and um, bought a guitar, that kind of stuff. But I went to Monrovia in the middle of the school year. So that was different. Mm -hmm. And my dad's carpool buddy, Walter's son, Jay, and I were the same age. And Jay was already at Monrovia. So he was going to show me the ropes. But the private school thing, um, when I got to Monrovia, I immediately got put in these different classes. I really didn't know why, but there's only a couple of us in there and um, met my friend, Ollie Hatchett, Ollie Hatchett nice. Jr. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, we became friends, but he went to Spartman and I went to Bob Jones. Well, you got to be in a band with that name. I know. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, the middle of the school year and Ollie was a trombone player and um he got me into the band i was a sports guy i played basketball and baseball and tried football i just wasn't cut out for football and and i think i could have been good but it always was during band season or during baseball spring season or something so i didn't really pursue football that much but ollie was a trombone player and a good trombone player so i decided to go try out for Monrovia Hawks marching band as a drummer. And this was in the spring or the winter. So I'm only one of the two drummers. So actually it was, you know, helped write the Monrovia cadence and everything. And I could still play it today if you mm. put a gun to my head about it. But that was cool. Well, let's, no. Yeah. <laughs> let's hear it, man. <laughs> no, it's not that good. It's very <laughs> rudimentary. All right. But uh then football season rolled around in seventh grade and the rest of the kids came. So there's now 13 drummers and I'm mm. like chair 13 of gotcha. the drummers and Gil Smith, the uh, band director, you know, um, sort of got me going on this theme, uh, in my life of nobody wants to play tuba. Why don't you play tuba? You don't have any competition, you know, mm. you know, you're going to get an A or a B just because you're the only tuba player. Right. So I had Ollie, you know, that was a lot of the motivation is Ollie was right next to me. So I could be near Ollie and, uh, play the tuba and I dug it, I really dug it mm. and, uh, learned how to read music there a little bit. And, uh, I played tuba all through high school and all through college. So a lot of bass players are converted guitar players. And even though I took lessons when I was young, I never really was much of a guitar player i love love guitar players mm -hmm. but tuba to bass was a really natural progression it's sure. in the yeah. same clef and everything so somewhere in there and i met another great friend of mine terry bat and he was in kiss and uh so we you know, like day one hey you like kiss yeah so he lived close enough to ride my bike too and uh, that's where the rock and roll thing started so it's kind of his fault now, i so, had records and stuff but the competition of who could discover a band first right. started with him yeah so did you i mean i know that you were in the band but did you have any bands that you put together in high school like with all your friends oh yeah so um terry played guitar and sing and he still does and uh he's fabulous but when i went to bob jones i met jimmy Jimmy started it and he's a drummer. And by this time I'd already converted to bass, I think. And that was a light bulb moment going to, you know, I knew I actually bought a guitar and I had an electric guitar. It was a Gibson Sonics and a PB bandit that I got from quarter music. And I was taking lessons from Gary Gilbertson and I sucked worse than ever because I was still playing tuba. Mm. So I was getting better at tuba and guitar was just not, I just couldn't play. Right. You know, I was just no good. Well, I've tried it too, man. You know, it's not my, not in my DNA. <laughs> I just felt so completely lost when I first started to try to play. And, um, you know, there was no YouTube or nothing back then, but, uh, there's people now that can just pick it up just like that. I know. And I'll give you an example. Nate, <clears throat> well, my son was, uh, we bought him a guitar for for christmas and i don't even know how old he was very very young you know and um we try I, I don't know if we actually i don't think we paid for lessons where were you living we were down in enterprise at rucker at okay. the time and um so 
he was playing, you know, dong, bang, dong, dong, you know, whatever, you know. Well, I saw, I'm going to forget, and he could probably tell me right now if he would say it, but there was this uh, YouTube uh, video that came out, and this guy, it was, it was a slap thing, like, bling, bling, and he was slapping and pop, 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 and he'd be playing this. Well, I was just watching, I'm like, Nate, it's like, you can play this, and I'm like, you're, <laughs> you're on to something. And I swear to God, about two weeks later, three weeks later, Dad, I got something to show you. He comes out there, and I'm like, okay, you know. In my mind, I'm like, all right, I, you know, be happy for him, you know. Don't <laughs> this kid? Bling, bling, pop, 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 pop. He played the whole song, and I'm just like, I know it's amazing. What the, what the hell? It's and to amazing. this day, you know, years and years. I mean, he can still play that exact thing. It's so amazing. some people, some I guess, why I'm saying this <clears throat> is because every there's people that have raw talent. <clears throat> I guess, yeah, every everything can be learned to. A, a certain extent, but if you don't have that baseline of interest, talent, whatever you want to call it, um, you can have very um, exact right pickers. It's just, but if you don't have that uh, in your head, you right. know, it's just you know not going to happen. And believe it or not, I sang in the choir at church, and I think it's natural for anybody to gravitate to what they're better at, and. Um, you know, I was better at sports. Mm. I really loved basketball, and um, but baseball was really my first love. So, bass playing and music and all those things was second fiddle to baseball for a really, really long time. And uh, kind of true to the tuba story, I was the catcher, and they're called the tools of ignorance because you know the, that's a rough gig being the catcher. Mm -hmm. But if you get to think about it, I mean, number one, nobody else wants to be the catcher. But you're able to, you know, analyze the batters. You call the pitches to the pitcher. So you're not, I mean, the pitcher is obviously the rock star of the baseball team. If you have a really good pitcher, your games are going to be easier. Well, you got to have that catcher back there talking shit to right. the batters, you know? All that. Get, get them out Dealing of the game. Dealing with the umpire, yeah. you know, and I was the kind of guy that, you know, if you, I don't care if the ball was way out in right field and there was no play to play, you still had to run me over. So I was dumb and pretty, I guess I was okay tough. Not tough enough for football, but tough enough to be kind of menacing on the baseball field. I like to think, you know. Stay away from my home plate. Yeah. <laughs> and I would run you over if you were in the way. It was yeah. just a different time, you know. Well, what, at what point in your life, I mean, it sounded like you had a bunch of interest in, in high school. Well, my parents were very active. You know, yeah. dad, dad's the engineer, and I know he – Worked at the Pentagon sometimes. He was in Dayton, Ohio all the time, like all the engineers in the neighborhood. That was the same kind of deal. And, um, you know, there's not as much, there wasn't as much to do back then. So he was then. a right pet. If he was in Dayton. Maybe. He went <laughs> Any a lot kind of, of reverse places. engineering going on up there? He, he, went a, he did a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, I know he couldn't tell us what he did. And we got to go to his office once because it was on the arsenal. Mm. But yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. So Terry and Jimmy, I'm in ninth grade at this point. You know, I played basketball in Monrovia and played baseball in Monrovia. We won a county championship. And uh, Mark Mincher was the coach. And it was his first year here. And you may remember that name because Don Mincher is his dad, who's in the Hall of Fame, who brought the Huntsville Stars to town. Mm -hmm. So that played a factor for me later. Um, but yeah, baseball was, we won a county championship. You know, they can't take that away. And I remember... <laughs> We won the county championship, and I had to go straight from the baseball field to the gym to play the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. Sweet. <laughs> the same day. Yeah. Didn't get to celebrate it that much. But, yeah, it was great. When, you know, winning a championship in anything is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people don't get to do that. So Terry and Jimmy and I were a band with no bass player. And uh, we were trying out bass players my parents had a lot to do you know smart they had us in their house practicing we weren't out practicing at somebody else's house and my parents kept me really busy because they knew i'd probably get in trouble mm. but i was really busy working jobs and we needed a bass player we were always trying out bass players and they were always older my dad would run them off usually um but then there was this cat that came and his name is eddie gunn this is his real name and he's he was a rock star to us. He was older than us by a little bit and swagger, you know, just cocky as can be, good looking guy. And uh, we found a guitar player named Tony Moyers who had been in a magazine. He was a shredder guy. 
So we had a real life to us guitar hero mm. in my house. And yeah, he was, he's still awesome. He's out there and he's, man, could he play? Well, Eddie decided he would just convert to bass and stole my whole band. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, where, where were you at in this mix? So you get, I was playing guitar. Okay. And somewhere in there, the, uh, between Eddie stealing my band, which was great because <laughs> that, you know, Eddie was that guy and we were, we were, he was just such the big brother type that challenged you on almost everything. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> it's good to have guys like sure. that in your life because you kind of hate them, but you kind of love them. Not only know? that, they push you too. They, yeah. So yeah, he would just, you know, playing guitar, he'd be like, that's terrible. Just turn your amp off or whatever it was. <laughs> and then nice. Iron Maiden came to town with 38 Special. And I've told this story so many times, but I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, so 38 Special and Point Blank and Iron Maiden was the opening act. And um, we got there early and Iron Maiden started early. So Steve Harris comes out and he's right in front of me and they're playing Wrathchild and he's playing bass. I'm just like, I'm getting a bass tomorrow. <laughs> mm. And I did. Mm. I took my Gibson Sinex and my PB Bandit down to Mike Barty at Quarter and Sons and got me an Ivanez Road Star 2. Mm. <laughs> I still have it. And then it began. Then it began. So if you already had a bass player and you bought a bass, how did that work I out? I stole the band back. Did you? Because I had a gig. Right. Okay. So I got us a gig and then it all started to come together. as oh, okay, this is how this is going to work. And then, you know, that's... That's high school. It, high school happened, seemed like it happened really fast yeah. for some reason. Always does. Yep. No matter. And baseball was big for me. You know, I played baseball at Bob Jones. And uh, I've never loved anything more than I loved playing baseball. Yeah. I loved it. So <clears throat> you that brought, brought us, brings us through high school. So I was going to ask you how you know, your life was going through high school, you know, obviously all the extracurricular activities you would have would keep you out of trouble. Yep. But for some reason, kids always find ways to get in trouble. Oh, yeah. And some get caught and some don't. So. My trouble is always stupid. Well, it always is. At I got age. caught skipping one time and my mom called well, that's me. not trouble. I'm talking. <laughs> no, I, I never got in that kind of trouble, but yeah. just, you know, I'm dumb enough to my friends could egg me on to be the guy that would try to the biggest jump in the neighborhood or whatever mm -hmm. and break my <clears> foot. <throat> yeah. Or and uh so Terry lived in the attic of his house. That sounds kind of weird, but it was just long it was cool. Long attic, stereo stuff, you know, posters on the wall, and we could walk right onto the roof. So <laughs> we dressed up like Gene Simmons and Ace Freely. We're out there on the <laughs> roof, right? And we have Kiss Alive 1 blasting at the neighbors, you know, yeah. across the street. We're out there. We're being Kiss. Terry says, hey, man, my guitar needs to smoke. Can you get some smoke? So I go back <laughs> in the house and get his sister's cigarettes or his mom's cigarettes. I come out there. <laughs> Five cigarettes. I've never smoked in my life. And I passed out and rolled off the roof, <laughs> dressed as Gene Simmons, <laughs> right into a bush. And I woke up. You know, and Gene, I had painstakingly made these boots, right? Gene Simmons' boots out of cardboard boxes or whatever. <laughs> and I'm in the bush and my feet are above me. And Ace Freely's looking down at me. And T Terry, you know, it's just this way with me. He's like, you dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> so no uh, paramedics called or nothing? No. Uh, oh, I, I remember. Uh, I hurt pretty bad, though. Terry and I are the friends that accidentally hurt each other all the time. Mm. So we really couldn't tell our parents because they wouldn't let us hang out anymore. Right. But we put each other up to a bunch of stupid, stupid stuff. No. <laughs> <It> got hurt <laughs> a lot. Did you have any jobs in high school, or was it? Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, when I was able to drive, my dad got me a job mowing one of his coworkers grass and, um, Pat Oliver was his name and he was in a wheelchair. So it was my first experience dealing with somebody handicapped on a real basis, you know, and, uh, I mowed his grass, you know, and I worked hard for him and, and it kind of spread. I was doing that whole neighborhood after a while. 
and then went to work at Hardee's in Madison of all places. The only restaurant in Madison. I think mm. it might have been the first chain restaurant to come to Madison on Highway 20, as we called it. So between mowing grass and that and baseball, I was pretty busy. And again, with Terry, <laughs> uh, we used to, uh, we loved prank phone calls and we loved this game we had where we would try to make each other laugh on tape. There was this black tape recorder we had that we got from my mom. It was just, that thing ought to be in the Smithsonian or something. But the deal was we'd get the paper and we would cut out the articles and we would add all these vulgarities and stupid stuff in it and just try to make each other laugh on camera. And if you laughed, I won. Mm -hmm. right? That was just this <laughs> dumb game. And, uh, you know, Terry is just a great writer of comedy. He's a great writer of songs and music and all that. He's got a sense of melody. He can just like, hey, check this riff out. And they're all killer. I never had that. You know, Terry and Jimmy were way more talented than me and still are. And uh, so I go to the radio station in Madison, WABT. It's in downtown Madison, near the church. Uh, near City Hall, and I walk in there, and I'm like, would you like to buy a sign for the baseball team, put it in the outfield? You know, that's how you yeah. paid some bills back in the day. And uh, her lady's name was Marlene, I remember that. And she said, you have a really deep speaking voice for a 10th grader. Would you read this commercial for me? Because I'm having trouble with it. It was kind of odd, but... Now that I look back on it, she got, you know, a free speaking role out of me. So I go in there and read this commercial. And she goes, that's great. Would you like a job? <laughs> and I said, yeah. She goes, can you start Sunday? All you got to do is play commercials in between the NASCAR race. I said, sure. So I had, this is way better than Hardy's. Sure. Yeah. So Sunday, I drove my AMC Gremlin to WABT and it rained. The race got rained out. So an hour into the race, they're like, okay, going back to the local stations. What do I do? Mm -hmm. So the phone call comes in. It's Eli Gold. You ready, son? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Eli Gold. Okay, we're throwing it back to the local. So they threw it back to the local, and I uh, put on Ernest Tubb, walking the floor <laughs> over you. <laughs> and uh, for like the first three or four songs, I didn't really say anything. And I uh, figured out the board a little bit, you know, and then finally said something. I came up with my air name and everything. My air name was Mike Marshall. That was in 10th grade. Yeah. Wow. Marshall Amplifiers. I'm mm -hmm. like, that sounds cool. It rolls out really good, you know. But I didn't have my FCC license yet. So uh, we could have gotten in trouble if anybody would have been listening probably. But uh, the radio st station helped me get my FCC license. So I had an FCC license and I worked in radio for probably another 16 years after that. So after high school, where'd you go? I, uh, and obviously that's leading in because we just talked about the, right. the DJ thing. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that's what you did in, in, in college too. So what, what did you go to college for originally? Well, I was still all into baseball mm -hmm. and, um, you know, senior, you know, Bobby Jackson, I had three coaches in three years. Bob Jones was still a County school. So we were playing new hope and Hazel green and Buckhorn. We weren't playing as like it is now. And, um, you know, we, we lost to Hazel green, but I got on the all-star team, which was cool. And, uh, I had been to a Florida state baseball camp and, you know, I was, not nearly as good as these other guys, but I had a passion for baseball and uh, got a little scholarship to Huntington and um, got down there to the campus. And I was like, this is not for me. They only have a radio station. You know, that's what I wanted to do was play baseball and, and do radio. And it became obvious that it was maybe you have to choose one over the other. It'd be tough to do both. And then visited Auburn. One of my dad's friends, John Nider, his son Todd was down there. I was in between the Nider kids. 
And Todd was down there, and they were going to show me around. Dad's like, yeah, he'll take care of you. He took care of me all right. We drank beer for an entire week and went to see all these rock bands. I'm like, I'm going to Auburn. <laughs> and they had a radio station. And, uh, you know, a lot of this is just luck. And uh, Yeah, before we get, to, <coughs> before we get there, <coughs> sorry. Um, so you, you had this band in high school. Oh, Mo so, so Monarch. We, yeah, so when you... We were called Monarch. Monarch. When you head out to go to, a, to college, what happens to that band? Obviously, it breaks up. Did, did the members that were part of it still keep it together, or was it just done that, and over with? That plays, you know... So I should say that we didn't do very many gigs. We did more practicing than anything. But Jimmy, um, excellent drummer, excellent musician, excellent at everything. We would go to his house in Madison and put on the headphones and just play bass and drums to the songs. Mm. So we got pretty good at doing that. And we learned and we learned and we learned and we learned all these songs, you know, and going to the record store and discovering that's the thing, you know, you, there was only one or two really good record stores in Huntsville. Now, like that, you know, if it wasn't on the radio, you didn't really know about it back then. You know, there was no YouTube, right, Spotify, right. all that kind of crap. Or you so, had an older brother or sister that right. had all that. I don't know where it happened, but somewhere along the line, maybe it was Terry. We be we hated anything on the radio. And it was, we were like this little gang of guys that only liked music that a handful of people had heard of. And we kept perpetuating that by keep continuing to buy albums of bands that pe you know people had never heard of. So we became further insulated with this. And you know we played original music and we played music like God, Tigers of Pantang and Motorhead. And you know if it was well known and on the radio, we didn't like it. We didn't like Kansas and Boston and. and Nothing against it, but I don't know how that happened. Maybe it's the underdog thing that we always like, but Saxon, you know, Maiden, Priest, all that stuff was happening, a new wave of British heavy metal. And it just seemed like that they weren't in Camelot music. You couldn't go to Camelot and buy a Saxon record or a UFO record. You had to go to Underground Records, which I think was on University Drive. So my guitar teacher continued to teach me playing bass. We just switched. And Jimmy was taking drum lessons. I was taking bass lessons. So between our jobs and school and all that, we had a Tuesday or Wednesday night where we would go to lessons together. Mm. And we would usually go to a record store. And Terry would meet us there or whatever. And we would all buy an album. And then we would tape it for each other and make all these mixtapes, you know, cassettes. So we were lots of cassettes and things. It sounds like you guys are pretty tight. I guess it would be a pretty big transition for you to go to college and not, those guys not go with you. I mean, did it they was. did they go with you or Terry went to Spartman though? Um, well, I mean, college. Yeah, we Terry and I were separated a bit by just going to Distance. different schools, yeah. you know. And we would still see each other and do stuff, uh, but Jimmy became more of the guy I saw all the time. And um, you know, his family was my family, vice versa. I would just show up on Sundays to eat lunch at his grandmother's house right there. And, you know, and Jimmy's little brother, Charles, and I became really good friends later on. But, um, yeah, Jimmy didn't go to Auburn. But I went off to Auburn and just, I left it all behind, you know. I was uh, really wanted to get in the metal band, you know. I did try out for baseball at Auburn. It didn't work out. I was out of completely out of my league. You know, Bo Jackson's in center field. I'm like, I ain't never playing. Wow. Yeah, I can wow. tell. You know, um, got to throw with him one time. You know, and I had to restitch my glove. <laughs> right. But everything you've ever heard about Bo Jackson is absolutely true. Phenomenal athlete. Mm. It was just like you're in, you know, awe of him. The talent. Um, yeah, and he had a presence about him too. You were didn't know whether to be scared or say hello to him or whatever. You know, uh, I spent three years of my freshman year at Auburn. I went part time the whole way, 
And uh, my part-time jobs were I actually transferred down there with Hardee's and lasted all of two weeks because uh, I think I had tickets to Auburn, Florida, and they wanted me to work. And I was like, uh, that's one of the only jobs I've ever quit. But I was like, I'm not working the Florida game. I'm going to the game. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have a job when I got back. And um, there's another character in this story that factors in. His name's Scotty Stewart. And um, my mom was in Calhoun for whatever. My mom just seemed to go to school all the time, which was great. So Calhoun's a local community college. Community college so yeah, yeah, mom went to Calhoun and she was in a class with this guy that she kept telling me was cool. You know, she really liked him. And so I go to work at this radio station and um, the program director there is a little bit older than me. And, you know, I was making commercials and I was having echoes and reverbs and all this stuff. He's like, no, that's not good enough. You know, just be solid. Use your voice. Read the card. Use your voice, read the card. If he said that to me once, it was 10,000 times. Mm. But finally, I got a commercial on the radio that I read, and I got a cut of it. So I'm like, okay, this is cool. I can work hourly and get commissioned. Then I learned how to sell ads and things like that. So radio was really good to me as a part-time job. Well, that was the same person. My program director was the same guy my mom was in class okay. with. So we became friends, and Scotty and I went down to Auburn together. And... um I think he ended up coming back, but he would help me get radio jobs down there. He lived down there for a while. We always worked these because back then before 85, you know, the rule was that a station owner couldn't own a station within a certain mileage. So, uh, you know, if I owned a station in Madison, I couldn't own another station in Huntsville. It had to be a certain mileage away. And that mileage was always Tullahoma, Tennessee. So I would work in Madison and then drive to Tullahoma and mm. work at that guy's station. So that was what it was all about. It's like you get that one owner who would have all these stations all over. And in South Alabama, I, I worked in Enterprise too. Mm. And um, so the radio thing happened, you know, at Auburn. And college radio was not paid, but it was cool. And this was before alternative music was a genre. It was really alternative. So it was my people, you know, metal. Uh, there was a hard rock show. And then the rest of it was alternative music. And it was bands that turned out to be big, like REM. But there, for every REM and U2, there was a thousand fantastic bands that came to town and played. Yeah, and I'd always want to come to you to <clears throat> probably promote them. Well, get, get any interviews with those guys that were coming through? Or? Yeah, well, college radio is different because, you know, it's a class. You mm -hmm. know, people are getting communications degrees, and the station is 24-7, and usually you had a one- or two-hour shift. That's a lot of students in a radio station yeah. on a weekly basis. But it was a great place to hang out. You know, if you weren't in class, if I wasn't in class, I was in the radio station, hanging mm -hmm. out, returning phone calls. And I got on with the metal show, you know, uh, because I had my FCC license and I had a massive album collection, I got to do that, which was cool. Need a break? Mm-hmm. Okay. Me too. I need a refill. So let's uh, <laughs> take these headphones that are burning my ears and okay. we'll, we'll be right back. So, we, so hey, we blasted through a lot of that. Yeah. So we're back now. We got some flies with us, you know, right. um, where we stopped at was college, but we want to yeah. revisit some stuff. Well, I don't want to, uh. I mean, I always looked back at myself as I would get myself in these situations where I knew I was not the most talented, you know, baseball was that way. So I had to work pretty hard and take the job that nobody else wanted. And kind of with tuba was the same way. And, and, you know, playing bass is kind of the same way too. But I don't want to discount the uh, adults and the coaches and teachers that mentors that helped me make a decision like that. Um, my parents had me so active that I was around adults a lot. And I think, you know, and we probably do this too for our kids. If it's, it's not even really the same, but you know, you're around at our, at our age, you were around adults a lot. And, uh, like the radio station thing, you know, the luck is preparation meeting opportunity. And even though I was prepared to read you know, radio script because of my dumbass friend Terry and I doing all our stupid stuff. You know, I knew it was a good thing to do because you're going to pay me to just sit here and, and talk and talk, you yeah. know, and, uh, I was not prepared that first day, but you know, and then, um, 
switching to tuba was that way too. So, you know, going, going to Auburn was a big decision, you know, um, free college, you know, at Huntington was a nice thing, but you know, my heart was taking me to the rock and roll radio thing, which mm. is what I, you know, kind of drove me to do that. So being in college, <clears throat> you're going through a communications degree and you're working, uh, the radio station there, you said it used like two hour shifts. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't sold on being in college because in my mind, I wanted to join a band mm -hmm. and, you know, you have no idea when you're that young, what that entails. And, you know, the flip side of having lots of advice and lots of mentors and coaches is they're like, yeah, that music thing's not gonna, you know, now you can, person can go to school and get a degree in music and teach. And that is a legitimate pathway. But for somebody that was marginally talented at best, it just didn't seem like I could do that. And it was also not very encouraged. It was always go to school, you know, and have, you know, at least go to school and then you kind of figure it figure out it on out. the yeah. way. And that's kind of the way, the way it worked. Um, forget what my point was, but. Yeah. Oh, to answer your question. So, yeah, I was really, you know, I was busy all the time and in high school, keeping me busy. And it just sort of transferred over to college. But, you know, there was intramural sports to play, you know, playing basketball was fun. Backyard football was fun. And uh, going to football games was fun. Working in radio was fun. And I got a band going down there and we were actually there's a lot of bands and that's, that's why I went there. There's so many bands down there. So it's the club app. Well, I'm sure college atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, there were clubs frat, everywhere. frat parties. I mean, yeah. you could, you could have a party in somebody's backyard, you know, and we got to open up for a lot of really cool bands that we don't know who they are. Um, but it, you know, I got to play and it probably seemed like I was more experienced than my counterparts, but my counterparts were vocalists and singers and, guitar players and mm. that's harder to do quite honestly bass you know bass can you can get to a gigging level pretty quickly with bass i found you know you just kind of converted it over to tuba from tuba to right. bass so and uh i spent all my graduation money on a rig that wouldn't even fit in my car <laughs> so my dorm room was this massive pv 218 210 rig and that alone was getting me attention. Oh, this guy's serious. Look, he, yeah. he can't even move his stuff around. He's so <laughs> serious. But we so, had some gigs at Auburn, man. you know. So what was the band's name there? Do you remember? That you that you were in? The Edge? The Edge. I remember it was something kind of cheesy, you know, that but we were but we, you know, we found John Eads. Um and there's another theme developing in my life, you know. At this time, guitar players and drummers, you know, try to find the best of all those mm. and play music that nobody really listens to. That was kind of our thing. But John wasn't going to have it any other way. Um, we did, you know, the band I had going was playing Lover Boy and stuff like that. And uh, John was like, nah, we're playing Pat Travers and Robin Trower and Iron Maiden. So Jimmy from high school actually yeah. moved down there for a little bit. Okay. We all lived in a big house, and uh, that one summer was pretty wild. I actually went to work for Enterprise Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning, roofing in August. Was that out of Enterprise? or were they, they were in Auburn. Okay. Uh, and uh, I actually moved to Enterprise because <clears throat> the job got done. But, you know, that job was hard. Oh, yeah. And I was not cut out for that. No. But I saved a guy's life on my first day. Really? So I was in. <laughs> did, he, did he get shocked? No. Uh, they put. I guess they put the new guy as the rope holder over the pitch. So that was my first job. Okay. And uh, we're up on the girl's dorm, and I'm holding on to Carl. Carl fell over the edge. Mm. And I'm getting drug off the roof. You know, my, my shirt goes over my head, you know, and everybody's yelling and screaming and Carl's hanging on the gutter, going down slowly, but slowly. And I'm going about to get to the pitch <laughs> of the roof and he didn't fall. Mm. So from then on out, I was in, yeah. you know, was, yeah, you got a job for life, <laughs> got a job for life, had friends for life. And uh, I think I drank so much beer 
every single day. And we had this big house right there at Auburn on the main drag, three stories, you know, we practiced at night, all the enterprise guys would come over and be the audience, be the audience. And yeah, it was, it was, it was a great, that was probably the most rowdy, wild three months of my life. Mm -hmm. Really didn't have any, and I really didn't have a whole lot of plans after that. But I was still trying. That's I think I'd kind of given up on, you know, trying to be in a metal band that was big because the radio station thing, you know, afforded me the opportunity to talk to lots of people. Because before metal became mainstream, before any of that music became mainstream, college radio was the thing that these smaller bands and labels were marketing to. So Striper and Armored Saint and you name it, you know, Metallica to some degree, Megadeth to some degree, all these metal bands that had albums out. There's so many of them. I can't even begin Queens, right? You know, begin to name them. We were playing them on our radio show and it wasn't the fact that we were playing them. That was the big deal. We had a newsletter that we sent out once a month and we would list all the bands that Mm. we played and we, you know, Tom Tatum, John Richards, Jr. and Mike Beam, you know, they had this incredible mailing list. So there was four of us always on the phone, always calling people, always getting interviews and stuff. And uh, we were trying to, uh, we were just, th- that was the promotion mm. for these bands. So, well, so that's what I was getting at before. You know, you said you had all these bands that were playing at the local, you know, bars and stuff like that. I would think that those guys would go to the, you know, yeah, obviously the local radio stations, but who's going to be going to the concerts? Well, they're probably the guys from the college. So I would think that they would go to college radio and at least call or talk or something. All that, you know, and Atlanta was pretty close. Yeah. And uh, the second year down there, my friend Tom from Atlanta, uh, he was a really good photographer. We became good friends. Uh, if we hadn't met when we met, we never would have met kind of thing, you know. And the parties were legendary at Auburn, you know, and punk rock was still a big thing. And Mike Kilpatrick was down there and, uh, we'd go to these parties and, and there'd be metal and punk playing, or it was, it was, you know, sort of separate at the time. It's like, if you were a metal head, you really couldn't go to a punk show. And if you were a punk, you couldn't go to a metal show. It was kind of weird to think about, but that's how it was. And we were always in Atlanta going to these shows, but because we were radio guys, we could go see DRI. We could go see Suicidal Tendencies, then Anthrax. And there was this New York connection, too, because, you know, Metallica got discovered or was signed to Megaforce or the label in New York and the Rods and Anthrax and all these bands were out of New York. And Johnny Z would call us every week to see if we needed anything or whatever. Mm-hmm. So if we wanted to go see Anthrax in Atlanta, we got the red carpet, you know. So the Guns N' Roses story, you said that that was even even better than that one. I, I don't even think I've heard this one. Well, they're 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 a rough bunch. Yeah, they're rough and, gr- well, he, and well, gross. He's, Axel's still I, I, rough. I meant to bring. I've got a picture of me and Slash that uh, ended up in one of the big magazines, and um, <laughs> so I thought it'd be funny. I'm wearing Slash's top hat in this picture. Mm. And I can find that. Well, I go back to Auburn. And guess where my next stop was? The clinic. Because I had lice from that stupid top hat. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of like the icing on the cake of all this completely gross stuff that just happened. Yeah. You know, and it was Motley Crue. And the tour where he had his spinning drum set. And it got to be where I didn't even want to be around him. I was I was uh, trying to write for a magazine at the time. Never got paid and never saw anything get in the magazine. But I had a thing that said I did. So I would just go to these shows and say, you know, it's, it's not like it is now. You know, you just go and say, hey, I'm, I'm supposed to be here and I'm doing this interview yeah. or whatever. Have a tape recorder or whatever. And... um Saw them two or three times, and I think it was. I know they played Atlanta twice on the tour and Huntsville in between them. So I saw them in Huntsville and twice in Atlanta. And that last Atlanta show, um, actually got arrested on stage. 
You did or they did? They Axel Rose got okay. arrested. Gotcha. And I was just like, this is too much. Yeah. So I drove back. Did it kind of remind you of the Motley Crue stuff that well, you, were, you were seeing? Well, Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses were on tour together. Oh. So well, this I, was all. You brought one. up Motley Crue in college. Well, I guess that was the same yeah, time. Okay. Is, okay. All, all, all at the same time. I was gotcha. still in school when all this happened. Okay. And, uh, you know, when we, our band played originals and we played around a lot and um, it just ran its course. You know, we sold all our records and got to play a lot of cool shows. I remember I got hooked up with this one band and we played MTV Spring Break in Daytona. That was pretty cool. It's not coming to me who that was, though. Mm. But it got to do stuff. But, you know, at the end of all of it, I began to realize I think it paid for any of this wow. this is all cool points and need to talk about and we've you know i've got some gold records that people gave us because we were on the stations that played on that kind of stuff P lots of posters lots of posters from the metroplex and i've got this big stack of posters that i need to do something with but you know got to see megadeth early on you know got to see testament early on and a lot of bands that were just as good as those bands that never did anything mm. after that at what point, <clears throat> well, first off, did you end up getting your degree mm -hmm. from Auburn? Mm -mm. So what What was the final straw that was like, okay, I got to do something different or go back or whatever? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, the three-year freshman thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, that'll be. Uh, so they were like, you're going to have to do something. And I think somewhere in there, I was decided I was going to be a studio guy. Yeah. But again my ability to even wrap a cable correctly, you know, is I have, I know nothing and can do nothing with equipment really. But I thought I would try Georgia state. I remember my dad took me down there. We gave it a shot, but it was in the middle of Atlanta. It didn't appeal to me. So I left, I had, I'm still working at radio. I think I got a radio job up here. And my dad was in Washington DC on some like summer deployment or whatever. So I went to visit him, and I'm still thinking, I'm still hanging on to my contacts that uh, I'm going to try to try out for bands in D.C. and Baltimore and see what I can do. Well, I had three tryouts in one day up there. You know, this is when you get the magazine or get the newspaper, like Creative Loafing or something, you get the ads and you call them up. Well, I underestimated the traffic situation. <laughs> and there I am with my massive rig trying to get this on a train or a bus or a cab or whatever. And I missed the first two mm. before cell phones. So I yeah. couldn't call. They just, it just didn't show up because I was, I barely made the third one. And uh, they, it, they didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> what? It, it was poppy and they wanted me uh, to sing, you okay. know, and that's another thing, you know, it's like, I you know, can't sing at all. And um, so another fortuitous luck thing happened right around this time. So I was still going to move there. So I came back and I got up with my buddy, Harold, who said, Hey, uh, cause Harold's going to UAH and he's playing trombone. And I met Harold in band at Bob Jones, piano player. And, uh, at the time we were great friends. We still are. We just hadn't seen each other. He's like, Hey, why don't you, uh, Come hear the UAH jazz band play at Bob Jones. Okay. So I did. And we uh, go to Bob Jones and we see the UAH jazz band playing. And I'm not much of a jazz guy, but uh, the guy's playing bass. And then he switches to tuba. And he switches back to bass. I'm like, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I go up to him afterwards. He goes, yeah, that's Rob. So we go talk to Rob, Rob Franklin. And uh, he's like, Talked to him, thought, you know, give him compliments and whatever, and asking him questions. Finally, he looks at me and goes, Come here. So he goes, I'm about to quit, be a police <laughs> officer. Go see Dr. Graves tomorrow. Because I told him I played tuba and bass. He yeah. goes, Can you read any music? I'm like, Yeah. He goes, Can you read this? He puts a piece of music up and I kind of hummed it or whatever. Mm -hmm. He goes, Okay, good. Then he told me. So the next day I go to UAH and my Harold, my friend Harold is just egging me on. You got to go. You got to go. You got to go. This is the greatest. So I, I go see Dr. Graves and I go in there and he's just looking at me like, who is this long haired? Come, you know, cause Rob quit like mm -hmm. just an hour before that. Yeah. So I told him that I played bass and he did the same thing. I would come in here and play this tuba music. So I did. And, uh, 
I remember, I, for whatever reason, I could read music on tuba, but couldn't read music on bass very well. So it was lucky that I got to play tuba first, because when I got on the bass, I just remembered what it was and played it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me a scholarship on the oh, spot. Wow. So I was still a freshman and uh, ended up going to UAH. And um, so that was complete luck. And I needed a job. So I saw I needed a job with insurance. I needed this, that, and the other. Because radio stations, you're patching together these part-time jobs. So I go see a runner for a law firm ad. So I go down there and um, apply for the job. And I'm older at this point. I'm older than most college students. And she gave me a job, 30 hours a week. as a law firm runner, had insurance and the whole works. Mm. And it was Rob Franklin's future mother-in-law. Oh, really? <laughs> so Small world, huh? it was like, wow. Okay. So I had enough sense to know that even though it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, it was a good opportunity yeah. to stay on my feet. So I came back to Huntsville and started playing in bands around Huntsville, going to college and working in the radio station. That lasted a long time. Yeah. So how many, <clears throat> so now that you're back in Huntsville, what, what year was this? Probably 90. 90. Okay. Yeah, a lot happened from 85 to 90. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> so I know where you're at now. So from 90 to now, man, that's a whole nother 30 years or so, right? Mm hmm. So rather than going through, can you hit on some of the highlights of the bands or, or some of the stuff that you were doing before your, your current situation? Or, yeah. Yeah. You know, my, I call it a career. I guess it has been been divided up into like four or five chunks mm -hmm. so this is chunk number two the uah years and i'm playing tuba and playing bass and um playing in local bands and i got a gig at the chicken shack with straight jacket and they really taught me how to be in a band and learn a lot of songs and i played with other bands you know and i graduated from uah into Still one of the best accomplishments. You know, UAH is hard, way harder than the other schools I had been to. I went to a bunch of different colleges, community colleges and things like that, just trying to patch my degree together to be legitimately in school. Because mm. I think I was cool with my dad if I stayed in school. I could do kind of whatever. As long as I was paying my own bills, stay in school. So UAH was no joke. And it was really too much for me. It was hard. And somehow I got through it. and. Somewhere in there, I met Mike, which you'll like this story. Mike who? Mike Roberts. Mike Roberts. So I'd heard of him and seen him play, but he went to Grissom. I went to Bob Jones. You know, Madison and Huntsville were just two completely different planets back no. then. And uh, Mike goes into the comic store on the parkway, and Terry Bat's working there. And they know each other somehow. Mike's like, I need a bass player. Terry's like, well, I got one for you. He's pretty good. Mike's like, who is it? He's like, Michael Klein. Mike goes, yeah, but he's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Terry's like, yeah, yeah you, just he's gotta, you just got to get used to him. You and and he's standing right behind you. No, I wasn't there. So, uh. Mike calls me at work. Oh, wait a minute. You wasn't there for that conversation? No. Oh, okay. So Mike, sure. Mike goes in the, the comic <laughs> book store. Terry tells him about me. And Mike goes, yeah, but I've heard he's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> Terry's like, well, yeah, he is. But, you know, you just got to get used to him. Because <laughs> if anybody knows the bad side of me, it's Terry Bad. We did so much. Terry, Terry's the guy that we did all the stupid stuff. I can't even. The stupid stuff I did without Terry around pales in comparison you know, because I became the ringleader, you know, with Jimmy and I got a lot of people in trouble. In Auburn, <laughs> I was the ringleader, you know, of all the stuff that happened. I could drink a lot of beer in college, you know, mm -hmm. we had a band going, you know, it was all good. But uh, I was here and humbled for sure. And I was in UAH and I was just like, oh my, you know, this is so hard. And finally graduated. And this might have been before I graduated, but, you know, Terry hooked us up somehow. So Mike calls me at work. And what do I do? I was a dick <laughs> because my boss was standing right there. I'd cut my hair and had a job and everything. And Mike's like, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> what's up with this guy? Somehow we ended up playing together. And, uh, you know, Mike's just one of those people that you believe in. I think if he'd have been a carpenter or something trying to start a business, you know, I would have been there to support that had I been a carpenter's apprentice or whatever. No. Just lucky that he needed, you know, a confidant bass player guy in his band and that we did that. So playing all the time, you know, it was great. And then um I moved to Charlotte. And uh So what year was this to that this had been ninety four or five. Okay. So I played with Mike and various others from ninety two to ninety four. And I remember it broke his heart. It sucked. Really? I, I thought you were such a dick. And you know, well, you know, why, <laughs> he got used to it. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, he started Five O'Clock Charlie when I was gone. So we were just playing this Mike Roberts show or whatever. And we were playing a lot. It's, it's Mike. Yeah. So gigs are fun. Everything's fun. And uh, opportunity came up to go to Raleigh and then Charlotte. So I did that and had to tell him that I was leaving. And, uh, he met Scott Kennedy, I guess, somewhere and started five o'clock Charlie. And I was up there. I mean, Charlotte was so good to me and it was luck, but my parents are from there. My grandparents were living there and, uh, I reinvented myself on the way up because I was down here. You know, there's a lot of really good musicians in Huntsville uh -huh. and, um, again, mediocre bass player at best, especially then I was extra mediocre. But, you know, there's John Onder, there's Jimmy Clay, there's Bobby Hendricks, there's Dave Anderson. Uh, so many, and all I was doing was taking these vacated bass gigs, and I was not really that good. I'm a, I knew I wasn't that good either, and I was just chasing my tail down here, and I had been humbled, you know, at Auburn and, uh, that didn't pan out. And I was here and realized that I wasn't that good. I needed to do something different. So I moved to Raleigh and there's other bass players in there that drove me up. Bill Abercrombie was another one. Every bass player here was way better than me. And I knew it. So I was trying everything. I was playing jazz. I was playing, uh, trying to sync all these things. I just wanted to play and be better and, be the best I could be, but it just wasn't really working. Where can I get that record of you singing? No, it's not. Well, can you give us a little sample? Mm -mm. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> Any band that's got me singing in it needs help beyond that. So many good bass players. Though. So I yeah. began to focus on bass, and then on the way to Raleigh, I'm just like, I got to, nobody knows me in Raleigh. I'm going to introduce myself as the bass player that doesn't sing. I play blues rock and country. So they didn't know anything about me at all. So that was my thing. And I got lucky, met people, played gigs in Raleigh. I uh, got to meet the guys in the crowd of love, and they were really cool. Brother Kane came up there, and I hung out with them, and um, moved to Charlotte. And you just look back on how it happened. It's like I met this guy, John O'Gorman, in a club one night. I was playing with my cousin. And uh, his bass player had just quit, and he had a new album out that I'd heard that day at a previous gig. I was like, this is really good, blues rock stuff, you know? And uh, Johnny O was like, I have a gig, and it's at the amphitheater next week. <laughs> the amphitheater. You know, Charlotte's a big town, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's happening at the time. You know, Panthers had just gotten there. The Banks and everything had just moved there. So there were more gigs than there were bands. So very robust music scene. And... uh I met Lee Kelly, the drummer Lee Kelly, and uh, he was legit. You know, I'd always heard about drummers like him, and now he, there he was in my living room. We're practicing, mm -hmm. and uh, John had a keyboard player named Chad Lawson, who was this kid from Hendersonville, North Carolina, and now Chad is the number one jazz pianist on iTunes. Mm -hmm. Look him up. It's amazing. And uh, we played this massive gig, and then we played this dive bar that night, and I walked out of there with $700. Wow. I'm like, I like this. Yeah. And um, that's pretty good. Yeah. For, what, a three hour, for, for three a, or four hour? And it was pretty good for a guy from Alabama, too. Mm. You know, I was this new guy, and like I said, there were um, just luck. Especially when you got to split it up between all, you know, that's pretty good. Yeah, it was great. And the, the Johnny O years, it was just a, 
blur of playing. I mean, we played six nights a week. Mm. It was fantastic. So if it was going so good up there, what made you leave that? I, I had a, I had a job there, yeah. you know, and, uh, I stayed there 10 years Okay, and, you know, every drummer up there was seemed just not that the drummers, you know, they were just, it's a metropolitan area. It's more metropolitan and bigger city, bigger, big time stuff. So the bands were bigger and the, the just seems like mediocrity wasn't going to cut it. What? Oh yeah. And I, I got lucky to play with people that would, they would just tell you, you got to stop doing that and start doing this. You know, Lee Kelly was really serious. I remember he had a metronome and he was dialing up the tempos, you know, and I was thinking, well, he's, so he's in charge. You know, he's, I'm the first guy I ever saw do that. Now it's a professional thing. I realize mm -hmm. that now. So he's dialing up the tempos and we're working on it in practice. And John would be like, that's too fast. And Lee would fix it or whatever. So I remember one time I was like, why do you do that? He goes, I'm talking to you. That's why. <laughs> so it was his signal to me. It's like Lee's in charge, yeah, which was fantastic, you know, and they're just so, I can't even, I got to play with so many great drummers up there. I mean, Donnie Marshall and Jim Brock and Scoop Pittman, Zach Bowen, James Augustus, my cousin, Michael Elliott, Howard Cormier, Rick Mannering. Every drummer I got to play with was a better drummer than I was a bass player. Mm -hmm. So you get better faster yeah. with those kind of guys. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Bob Dunlap, you know, passed away in the last year, was probably one of the best musician friends I've ever had. He was a drummer, played for the part-time blues band, and we got voted top band in Charlotte, you know, like for a decade. It was great. You know, John moved, John O'Gorman moved to South Carolina, but he was in this Thursday band and, you know, they had a bass player, uh, Mike Federal, who played with Bette Midler back in the day. And he knew a million songs and he, okay, bass player, I guess, but he, he could sing really well. Mm. Well, he had to take medical leave. So I got to play on Thursdays. It was like being in Little Feet or something. I mean, so much great music, you know, our keyboard player was, um, fantastic mike peters then it was grub and so it was counting down to time for mike federal to come back i had to give up this gig <laughs> you know and uh, he came in and heard us a couple of times and he's like yeah i'm coming back next week i'm like okay he goes but i'm gonna play acoustic guitar and keep you on bass so that was one of the greatest compliments that i've ever gotten yeah you know I, you know we kind of changed the songs and things like that but Bob Dunlap, the drummer, uh, we became great friends. I don't think he really wanted me in the band, but I think he knew that he could uh, teach me. And he yelled at me a lot and told me straight up what to do and what not to do. You know, why are you bringing that rig? It sounds like a, a jet airplane or whatever. There was just so many. But once I finally got to where he trusted me, we became really good friends. Mm. And I owe him a lot for teaching me so much about how to be a professional and how to play music and how to support the leaders of the band. You know, I think that's the biggest lesson I learned up there is uh, it didn't seem to be this big free-for-all like other bands I had been in. It was like the rhythm section it was new to me. We, we had a job, and that was to play what the guitar players and the singers needed. And sometimes the guitar players and singers would tell you what they needed. Other times they would just indicate it somehow. So we talked a lot about that and how to support those guys. Because if you're the singer, the singer is the leader. Even there, if they're not the leader of the band, if they're singing, they're the leader. Mm -hmm. And you should, according to Bob, be doing everything you can to support them. Don't be distracting. Don't have them look at you. No. You know, you want to be invisible to them. You just want to give them every rhythmic thing they need to do what they got to do. Mm. And we had a lot of conversations about that, which was great. You yeah. know, we, well, that's how you learn from people, you know, that are better than you, obviously. They have to tell you too. They have to talk to you, right? you know, yeah. and he was one of the first people to, I learned a lot from the guys in straight jacket too. Uh, Robin and Tracy, you know, Robin's gone. But, uh, so yeah, I was in Charlotte and, um, a job, Laid me off. I was working a warehouse type deal. 
and uh, my son had been born, and they were said, well, we can lay you off or we can move you back to Huntsville. So decided to do that. Mm-hmm. But I'm a list guy, as you can see here. So I had this list of pros and cons. So I called Mike up. To, Mike came up here and actually did a record called The Chain. It's really good. So Mike and I, he started at 5 o'clock Charlie down here. Of course, they're kicking ass. And uh, we were visiting each other all the time. And he'd come up here and play gigs. And i come down here and play gigs. And um, before I get too far, Brian Williams was another drummer here in town that I'm sure I was terrible compared to the way he was drumming. And he sang too. So I, I'm sure I interfered with everything he was doing on stage. <laughs> but he would he would yell at me and tell me what I needed to do. No. Yeah. So I've had some really good teachers and I uh, guess I'm not real fun. You know, I like bass players, but, uh, I'm more about the drummer and the guitar player than I am. Well, m- most people I've seen most, you know, obviously I have a very, very limited background in being in bands and stuff. But, um, I mean, if the bass and the drummers aren't in sync with each other, I mean, it just jacks everything up. Right. So, uh, some bands, yeah. you know, the drummer will play towards the lead guitar, and eighty percent of the other bands, it's, it's the bass and the drummer kind of kind of setting the, setting the pace. Yeah, and um, and you know more about that than I. But well, I've learned recently that I th- the I think the average music listener doesn't hear all the stuff that we hear. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the average music listener knows if the vocalists are any good, and they know if the drummer's any good because. Most people that dance dance to a particular beat and rhythm, and if it slows down or speeds up, they know it because yeah. they're dancing to it. And uh, just about anybody knows that the singer's no good. So the bass guitar, rhythm guitar, keyboard stuff, I don't think the average person knows that. But inside the circle, we do. So there's a lot of nuance that goes on in there. And uh, I tend to get in situations that I can stay in for long periods of time. That's what I you know, the, the camaraderie and the cohesiveness, I think just gets better if you're able to, uh, stick with the same guys, the consistency yeah. of all that. Sure. So coming back here, what year was that? That 2005. Yeah. So you, so you knew you were coming back here and you called Mike. And yeah. You, I said, Hey, I think I'm coming back. Um, uh, I remember I'm up there and have just had the best decade of my life playing everywhere from Key West to New Jersey to Puerto Rico. And, making records and playing all the time, making great friends. But, you know, now I had a kid, so things had changed. And uh, I called up Mike. said, I, you know, is there any bands down there that need a bass player? He said, no, you're a dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that really happened, though. <laughs> all right. But, no, he said, uh, he goes, yeah, Toy Shop's looking for a bass player, I think is what it was. I never, never heard of Toy Shop. Oh, they're fantastic. Really? It's the Sharp Brothers and, um, you know, Andrew Sharp. He's a great musician. And I played with, the, you know, played with them in a band called Uncle Spam for a while. And again, you know, I'm, there's another bass player that's just better than me at the time. You know, it's just everywhere I was playing, I was gigging and I was making money and that was good. I'm having a flashback here before I moved to the Carolinas. I was just like, man, I gotta, gotta find a way to get better because I'm not getting better. Mm. So that's when I relocated, and now I'm coming back to Alabama. And uh, Mike called me back and goes, I want you to come down and play with us. So that was, I've got the list somewhere. It's like I, they were, Huntsville and Charlotte were pretty equal, but coming down to play with 5 o'clock Charlie put it over the edge. Yeah. So, you know, they'd had really good bass players before me too. Mm-hmm. So, again, Pretty lucky that that happened, and um, so yeah, the rest is history. So you've been with them back again since two thousand five, right? So how many albums have there been out since two thousand five? Ooh, um, two, two. Yeah, you know, the new one is the best one to me. I think you know the well, I don't know. The first two records are, I mean, Steve Lenny plays bass on the first record, and that's got all the iconic. Mike songs on mm-hmm. it. And Matt Ross is on the second five. I can't even play that album. It's so good. You know, Matt's a really good bass player. 
and uh, faster and more articulate. And uh, they're, that album rocks. And uh, those two records are really good. And I, in my mind at the time, felt like, all right, I'm going to bring Mike up to Charlotte to show him what I can do in Charlotte because I helped produce a record, produce that record, and uh, got some killer players on it. And The Chain is a Mike Roberts album, but you know, occasionally we'll play a song off that album. But mm. you don't have that one. You have to listen to it. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> But then there's Redneck Zen comes out. Mm. And that's, I don't remember what year that was. But something happened. And the playing on it, the songwriting is great as always. But there, it just, the end product turned out to be pretty bad. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I say it's reverse psychology. You know, we, we made a record so bad that people decide, oh, I'll just go hear them live instead because I can't listen to this record anymore. <laughs> So who are your, your biggest influences? Uh, and I, I guess I want to narrow it down specifically to to bass players. I mean, who, I'm sure there was a lot of them, but there has to be some like a top one or top two or three that you think that you really looked up to and was like, man, I, I want to try to imitate sure, we'll for a while, but then obviously you're going to get your, get your own style, but uh, who kind of developed? Well, Steve Harris was the one that, was the light bulb moment mm. for Iron Maiden. You know, that was the one of the baddest things I ever saw. I mean, you know, Iron Maiden was four feet from me, and I'm like, I'm buying a bass tomorrow. Mm. So that was the thing that kicked it off. But my number one is is Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. You know, uh, innovative. Just every, every I, I can play every note. I can play every Black Sabbath album. Mm. There he is. <laughs> He's one of the few that I've sat down and go, okay, I'm going to, learn this guy's entire catalog and there's a lot of really good ones but you know i tended to gravitate towards being the complementary figure in the band because bass players aren't playing with other bass players they're playing with drummers so one of those guys taught me that you know you need to learn drum language and you know and being a tuba player you know in a support type role for an orchestra or a pet band or whatever the tuba player and the bass player, they're never the focus unless you're singing or writing songs, but I'm not. Right. So I kept that little lesson to myself and like, that's how I'm going to be. So I tend to emulate and really look up to bass players that have been in bands for a really, really long time and think about all the things that they had to negotiate, you know, like Ian Hill from Judas Priest has been in that band for 50 years. Mm. And, uh, They've had five or six drummers. I just know? wonder, I mean, I hate, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I just wonder if you've been in a band that long, how, where do you pick up other ideas or influences? I mean, obviously you're listening to other music, but I mean, like you said, you didn't learn, I mean, you learned throughout your life, but you really hit a, a pinnacle when you went to Charlotte and was exposed to all these different mm-hmm. professionals. I just wonder how people that's been in bands that long they must have to get out. I mean, how do you get out when you're that famous to go to, you know what I mean? To different events and to see people live and see, yeah. you know, there has to be something. Who knows what, you know, those guys do. I, I'm sure that, um, they have periods in their career where they've taken time off or mailed it in for a little bit or had a rough period or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, um, it, you know, all of it is a challenge how to be the best you there is no. and at some point you do reach an age where you're not influenced by other musicians that much you've got all the basic knowledge that you need and you can become better simply by changing genres or getting into reggae or getting into whatever it is mm. you know south african music or whatever and i'm fortunate to have you know i think you know, music education, whether you become a music major or a music minor or whatever, just getting around teachers that can help you connect the dots. Um, it, it may not make you a better, you know, hands on the fretboard player, but it'll help you communicate with your fellow musicians. Because if you're doing it right, everybody in the band is better than you. That's what you hope for. Is that, but you also want to be able to hold up your end. And, um, you know, Rusty Barkley and all those fabulous guitar players in Charlotte, you know, just learn how to be, learn quick. 
How many different, so now that you've been back with Five O'Clock Charlie since 05, I mean, that's like 20 years now. So how many different iterations of, uh, and Mike was on here, and I think I'd ask him about that, but I don't think we went into it as far as how many different people has been. Right. I know you've had a couple different drummers and a couple different other uh, guitar players. So at the CD release party, I, I brought it up. You know, there have been, now Mike knows some of the early, early history, but to my knowledge, there was Steve Linney on bass and Matt Ross on bass and then me. And Scott Kennedy was the original drummer. And when he left, we had Ricky Fargo for a period of time. And he was so different than Scott that it played to our strengths a little bit more because we had Chad in the band at the time. And before Chad, I think there was a keyboard player. I think Mike brought that up, mm -hmm. but I wasn't here for that. And even Clint Bailey was in the band for a little bit. And then um, now we got Dwayne. Yep. So Mike's been in the band the entire, I mean, he, sure. it's his band. Right. And, you know, even though it's called Five O'Clock Charlie and not Mike um, Roberts and the Heartbreakers, right. but Dire Straits, whose band is that? That's Mark Knopfler's band. Yeah. You know, that's just how it goes. And he's the singer songwriter. So, mm -hmm. um, using some yeah. of the lessons we learned, I'm just trying to be there and, and help with these recordings and these. Well, I think it's really good to see. I mean, like you said, it is Mike's band and it always will be, but he has been able to relinquish a little bit of that, I think, with Dwayne. And I, you know, putting myself in Dwayne's shoes coming into something like that, uh, bringing Dwayne on, I know how Dwayne felt before he actually started and how he looked up to Mike. I mean, like everybody does. And didn't know if he was, you know, good enough or or whatever. I mean, those are my words, not his. But um, I think him coming to the band has really brought a whole different atmosphere of it. You know, adding adding to it, and but not really taking anything away. You know, he brings a a, a, right. to, a total different genre. Not not that you know he didn't do Mike and you guys ever didn't do that kind of music, but with his voice. Um, Brings a total different atmosphere, you know, I think, to it. I agree. You know, like the Almond Brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, they've had changes in members, and some of them were drastically different than the person. Right. But when it's right, it's right, you know. Uh, I mean, Dwayne's a five-tool player. You know, he sings, he plays good guitar, he looks good, he books jobs, he's got stuff, yep. you know. Uh, he helps with the, you know, setting up and tearing down the PA, all the things that a good band, you know, you need that if it's going to work right. I'm sure there's people that don't like Dwayne, but I haven't met him. I mean, everybody I've talked to. Well, it is a shock to the system, I think, you know, when you're all of a sudden doing country. <clears throat> and it depends on when the last time you, you saw Five O'Clock Charlie. Mm -hmm. Because when Ricky Fargo got in the band, we started doing more country. Because he's a good country drummer. No. And Chad loves country. Mm -hmm. So we started doing more of that. No. And uh, as a bass player, it was a challenge. Now, Dwayne's hardcore country. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like, to me, in my mind, it was like that all over again. People are like, how can you, how do you enjoy playing country? I'm like, you know, country's hard for me. Country's difficult. You know, it's like taking a, as a bass That's player, pretty shocking for me to hear it's that. It's not. It is not as simple as it sounds, and it kind of goes back to my tuba days. You blow a note. Well, there's all these things that go into a note. How wide is it? And how long is it? And how tonal quality is it? All those things. To me, playing bass, country bass, is like taking a pencil, and making a dot on a piece of paper, and then taking the pencil and making that same dot on that piece of paper all night long without widening that dot at all. Be mm -hmm. as precise as you can because that's what country is. Yeah. And it's very, and I, you know. So do you enjoy the difficulty or does it become kind of mundane for you or mm -hmm. is it something that. It's not mundane. No. But, uh, you know, uh, the other theme in my life is, you know, the drummer's so damn good. I mean, Billy Tyke, oh, yeah. you got to have him on this show. I want to if he wants to. <sighs> yeah. Uh, he's the you know, unsung legend in this town. Absolutely. I mean, you could set your watch to that guy. I mean. And, and Billy and Bob have a lot of 
characteristics in common. So yeah. emotionally for me, I hear Billy do a lick and it's just like, yeah, that was kind of going back to my roots in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Billy's very, we're lucky to have him. He's very, very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, it's fun, you know, and so Mike now has to learn how to be a country side man. You know, that's the thing about these singer guitar player guys. Um, a lot of them, like those two specifically, haven't spent a ton of time being a side guy. And I've spent all my time, my entire career being a side guy. So, you know, I, I, I listen to them trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, rhythm guitar player is vastly, you know, nobody, rhythm guitar player is so important. And you got, because like Dwayne, he's singing and playing, but then Mike takes a solo. Wayne's got to, Dwayne's got to join the rhythm section for a little bit. Mm. So he's got to play both sides of the fence in one single song. Yeah. So, although I could, if he ever asked me about his singing and lead play and I'd tell him, but for me, I care about the rhythm guitar playing. So there was some burn in period there where it's like, okay, I'm finding new bases to play. You know, what's the right bass? What's the right rig? What's the right volume? You know, Dwayne's trying to find his right rig and his right guitar and his right volume and learn all these songs and try to play rhythm to our standards, so right. to speak. Yeah. Because we'll we'll say, hey, let's try this on this song, or you know, that note might be wrong right there. And it might be like the record, but Mike doesn't play like the record, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> So he Mike had mentioned that uh he's gonna start a new introduce a new album. Has has that started yet? Yeah, we uh Billy recorded some of it the other day. Yeah. It's a song we've been playing live for a while, but yeah, it's time, you know, when Mike is in the mode. Well, he he said something about writing new songs and he said he, you know, he was we had to, I don't even know if you call it an analogy, but um where he was trying to get into Dwayne's mind of how he was saying it and what words he needed to come up with to to fit how Dwayne sings how, it. How Dwayne sings right. it. Right. So, I think he did a good job last time. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> so do I. But I'm just bringing this up because they said he has some new ideas that yeah. he, he's going to try here recently. I just didn't know if that was already in effect or if, uh, I'm sure we'll hear about it soon. Because <laughs> <Well, laughs> I was, you know, I've known Mike a long time and we've been playing together a long time. I mean, he wrote a lot of the big time songs that people love. You know, some of those he wrote in my house in Charlotte and some mm -hmm. of them he would run by me. You know, It'd be cool to think if I was the first person to hear, you know, Voodoo or June or whatever. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize this, but I played Voodoo. I'm the first guy to play Voodoo on the Mike Roberts album way back. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, I may not be the flashiest or even the best of anything, but I, I'm going to go down in history as the guy that's played Voodoo on the bass the most. So tell me, man, tell me some things that, tell me a couple of things that uh, you want people to know that we don't know about you. Mm. And we'll, and we'll and we'll narrow that down to two so make sure they're okay. good. Well, I can still tell you my favorite bass players. Well, I asked you that. I only got through this list a little oh, bit. Well, hell. I want to get I want to get in some guys that Absolutely. don't. Absolutely, do it. So, Ian Hill of Jesus Priest. Okay. Think about the 50 years he's oh, yeah. been in the band. Right. Yep. It, you know, is he going to set the world on fire with his bass playing? No. But he's the bass player for Jesus Priest. Right. Who knows what he had to negotiate and all the interpersonal things that happened in that band? Not to mention the different drummers he had to bring on board. Mm. So I think about the role that he played, probably unsung, but meant those guys know. And you know, Jerry McAvoy played with Roy Gallagher for thirty something years, and uh, you know, he was his right hand guy. You know, and I tend to read about how he negotiated certain things because that's the way this band is. Yeah. Know? In this new thing with Dwayne, I mean, there's probably some country songs that are going to come out of this that are going to be fantastic. Yep. So looking forward to that. What was the question? I forgot already. Well, you were saying you're going to go down your list of uh, oh, I did. bass, yeah. and then I'll go back to my question. Okay, I think I just did. Okay. Yeah, so what I was asking you is a couple things that um, you think, well, we already know that you're a dick, right? So we don't have to go down that road. But <laughs> Personality <a> <laughs> challenged. I've never Working seen on that. I've never seen you be a dick. Well, I didn't so. talk to you for five years before we actually well, started that, talking, so that was my dick <laughs> period. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, well, I guess you were being so, a dick. You wouldn't talk exactly. to me. So. Okay. So I get the so the questions was, you know, um, a couple of things that you want 
well, not even want people to know, but uh, some things that about you that would be would surprise people, I guess, or um, okay. have known you for a while and be like, oh wow, I didn't know that about him. Well, I, you know, I have a twenty one year old, right? So, um, being a dad, it's a big deal, as you know, and that'll change you, change your perspective on stuff. Um, probably the most shocking thing that people don't know about me is that uh, we adopted a girl in our family a long time ago mm. and she got murdered. It was tough. Yeah. Well, of she, yeah I didn't know anything about that. Yeah. It's uh man, that's horrible. It I'm is, sorry to hear it's, about it's, it's, ru- it's a weird thing. How long ago was this? Six or eight years ago. Mm. And, and this, man, I imagine yeah, it's, uh, it's some, yeah, it's, it's just the craziest, but it, it, again, it's a perspective thing. So puts life in perspective. Sure. And, yep. You know, like I heard Mike saying on the thing the other day, he's, um, you know, he's trying to stay healthy and, and keep doing this because we're lucky at this point. I, you know, I, I knew as a kid, I always wanted to do this, but I didn't know the form it was going to take, you know, I, Trying to be, you know, I thought the be all end all was being in a metal band that was famous or whatever. And then I found out that's, that's not that great. So I had to take another path and another path and another path and another path. But I never stopped. So I think the perseverance thing, you know, I used to get upset. And then maybe this is something people don't know. It used to really bug me that my band here in town doesn't get a lot of credit for being as good as we are. And uh, now with the new music thing in town, you know, the local gigs are getting siphoned off by yep. all this other stuff that's really cool to do. You know, we got great bands playing right in our backyard and nobody goes to hear them. There will be a time, who knows when, but there will be a time that somebody or whoever comes along and hears or or, or even somebody might throw them a CD or something and somebody's going to be like, man, those guys are good. Who is this? And then they're going to realize the lineage, lineage that has gone in to building what it is up now, and mm-hmm. you all might be, be dead. Nice. You might be dead, <laughs> or you might be still alive and be able to benefit from it. I think but, it's good, but that, even you're you know, still benefit, benefiting from it, even though you're gone, because you know there's going to be people that's going to hear it, and not that a lot of people don't hear it now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I agree. You guys are nowhere near as big as I think you should be. Not, a lot of bands like that. Not though. that not that you're not very prominent here in Huntsville anyway. But um anyway, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you no, off. No, that, that's that's a great observation. I think what's happening in Huntsville, I mean, again, I love my hometown and I love the area, and it's kind of neat to see this resurgence. And um it's it's good. Ultimately it's good for us. You know, Mayor Battle has done put his money where his mouth is, and uh we've got this music officer guy in town. And uh, I think that... Uh, and I met him the other night. Yeah, he's like 6'8". <clears throat> and I yeah. didn't realize his background. Yeah. I was oh, very, he, he knows what he's doing? I was very shocked. At, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know? Well, this is a great place to be. I mean, who doesn't want I to agree. Live here? I, I agree. But at the time, I was like, man, that's... And then, you know, the whole amphitheater coming and everything mm-hmm. and the, some of the acts that we've had come here. Ditto Landing. Ditto Landing's coming, coming up. Um which is my old stomping ground. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Well, I think it's going to, you know, what the town is missing. This is just my opinion. But the towns that I have lived in that are successful, robust musically, have two things that Huntsville doesn't have. Record labels, and booking agents, slash managers. Do you really need, coming from somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, do you really need record labels these days? Yeah. With the, with the amount of mm-hmm. social media because stuff. It, it's a business at the end of the day and mm-hmm. a record label is a business trying to make money for themselves and the artist and they connect people how these bands that are new and young are getting these opening acts for established bands or because they're on labels mm-hmm. and I'll use you know Jimmy Speed is and the grass ring as an example I was in Jimmy Speed for a while and I'm in the grass ring now. So, Jimmy Speed has everything you need. Great songs. Good videos. Um, they look good. They play good. 
It sound good. They got everything you need. Why can't they open up for Weezer when they come to the Orion? They're, they'd be perfect for yeah. it. Yep. The, the reason is nobody can get them there. There's nobody in town that can say, hey, Jimmy Speed, I have a roster full of talent, and we'll match you up with these bands that are coming to town that rock at Mars and Orion. Grass Ring's the same way. You know, three, three good records. Well, can't, why can't that music director that's here permanently now? I'm glad you asked that. His job is to do what Mayor Battle says. He's got, it's just like any other job. You have goals and objectives that we know nothing about. He's not out there trying to solve why Angry Native and Trace Locos, who are awesome, aren't getting enough gigs. That's not what he's here for. And when we go to these quarterly music meetups that he does, you kind of understand. And the analogy I made is like, well, let's pretend it's not music. Let's pretend it's coaching. Let's say we have a sports coach officer working for Mayor Battle. And his job is to bring more athletic events to Huntsville, build more fields and do that kind of stuff. You know, it's the same kind of thing. We have lots of teams here and we have lots of coaches here already. Is what this coach officer does, is it going to help these local coaches, these local teams indirectly and maybe, but if the NBA has a game here, are they going to get the local intramural team to play for them? No, the NBA is going to have good. a WNBA. To, but, see, <laughs> but no, they're not. Because our bands in town are as good as these bands that are touring around with these hard rock acts. Yeah. But we're not getting the local spots. And the music officer isn't going to solve that. Mm. Uh, what he is doing in the long run, I think it's going to pay off, is he's, this whole thing is generating a business platform for somebody to do that. We need somebody to come to town that knows what they're doing and become a booking agent mm -hmm. that can handle these bands. Yeah. There's a lot of great bands in town. Angry Native and Trace Locos are so good. Yeah, is Chris still playing with Jimmy? Jimmy Speed? Mm -hmm. Is he? Okay. So that's just, you know, the grass rings the same way. Three good records, all really good musicians. America came to the concert hall. I'm like, the grass ring would be perfect for that. Nope. Why isn't the grass ring or any band that would be suitable with America or Little Feet, why aren't they opening up? Because no, there's no business person here getting them to do that. That's what's missing. I would think, I mean, I, I know you just explained it to me, but I would think that the music officer would be able to have somebody that has some kind of insight that would be like, hey, this guy's coming. I know these guys. Here, let me play a song or whatever. Right. And the music officer's like, yeah, you're right. Let's do it. Why, why is there not somebody in that guy's ear or if it's not him himself? Well, that, that question comes up a lot, yeah. you know, and the quarterly music meetups that he does kind of addresses that. That's not what he, I don't believe that's what his job is. His job is Well, his to, job is probably to get very strong popular acts into Huntsville but he seems like he's doing his job pretty good if that's his only job but why could he not have some say in the who's backing that up maybe I should call him yeah <laughs> you probably could yeah yeah I just don't think that I think uh, the local I mean if you're seen expects too much out of what this role is. Well bullshit. Because you know, if you're here to support Huntsville and make Huntsville a spot, why are you not supporting local Huntsville? Well, and and I if think they're, if they're good enough. Now if they suck, I would I would say that the answer would probably be, well, I am. No, you're not. I've got the Orion coming. We're having this major music festival coming. You know, you're gonna get a coach type answer out of that. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna write a, I'm gonna write a, yeah. a, an email or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and honestly, I'm not just being biased because I live here. I mean, I've I've seen all these people. And listen, I'm gonna be the first one to tell mm -hmm. you, hey man, you sound good, but you you're you're not there. You know, you're not there to open up for that. But there, there's bands here to include Five O'clock Charlie that I wouldn't even call it potential because the potential is already there. 
they're good enough and deserve those spots to to open up or to at least showcase before those guys. You know, who, who's who's booking the guys before them? Or is there nobody before them? Why isn't there not somebody that's that knows the local scene mm-hmm. and to show what Huntsville has to offer? I think I think the it's a music business. Well, I get and it. all the tentacles that go with that. You know, these bands that are coming to town have business relationships with labels and agencies, all the stuff, venues, all that. They already have these established working relationships. So all they got to do is trust their managers or whoever and to put an open act in front of them. Mm-hmm. It's, so, all, it's baked in already. So those are already decided before it even gets here. Yep. Okay. Now, I think the, I think there is room to address your question. Now, there is room to have side stages. Maybe Huntsville has something before the Slipknot concert or before, you know, outside or something like that that is totally separate from them. Because what's the goal here? I mean, if you open up for somebody in Mars Music Hall, ultimately your goal is to sell the merchandise, which you could do that if you played outside of Mars Music Hall before the entire show and you drew people and you sell your merch there. Because at this point, we're just merchandise salespeople. Mm-hmm. Touring and all those things are not nearly as lucrative right. as it once was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I saw uh we you know, Forest Haven, a metal band opened up for nonpoint at Sidetracks. And I don't recall if we got any money from the door. But Nonpoint's a big band. And I think they sold eleven thousand dollars worth of merchandise that night, and we sold out of everything we had. Mm. So I've seen firsthand that that's the current business model. And touring is not as lucrative as it was before. Now, Huntsville is different because of the demographic. You know, the bands that are coming to the Orion are the same bands that came here, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And it's because people will pay money to go see that. No. But they uh, were not going to go pay money mm-hmm. to see a local rock band in a local club especially when there's all this free stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back to my other, the question that started all this. <laughs> so we got one thing. Is there anything else you want? I'm a ABBA fan. We'll cut that out. Love ABBA. I do remember you and saying I'm a Yorkie that. too. And I'll be real honest with you. I, <laughs> I would say I know who ABBA is and I remember hearing songs from when I was a kid, but I couldn't tell you one song from ABBA. Oh man. The bass lines in that Do song. I need to go back and revisit that? Yeah, it's good stuff. Was well, it going to... Oh, never mind. I won't say that. So uh, an idea I floated over the weekend that I think really has some legs is you know how Kiss did their last show and then... Which one? <laughs> well, no. Like last weekend, they did their last show and at the end of the show, they brought out their avatars. So Kiss is going to continue touring, but as avatars. Mm. And ABBA did that. ABBA, you know, uh, had a show come... They're not ABBA. They're avatars, video images, you know. Okay. I say we need Skinner avatars. Leonard Skinner avatars, all 50 of them. The tour is Skinner. You think that would work? <laughs> I mean, would people pay? Them? It's a joke, but but that's where we're headed, you know, oh, in yeah, a lot I of mean, ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, man. Um... We can do... Take a break? Get a beer? Well, one of two things. Okay. I guess one of three things. We could take a break, come back, and talk about anything else you want to talk about. Or we can call it quits right here. Okay. And say, we'll do it again, because like we talked about before, which we didn't get on camera, we're going to have a lot of these, to include you, hopefully, um, back to expand on a lot of well, stuff. Well, did you we ask talk- everything you wanted? I think I did. I'm sure when we're done, I'm going to come up with other other things, which is why I'm... We're going to have part twos and threes and everything. Um, so that's one. Um, two is the end of here. Three is the end of here. Take a break and do what you want to do at the beginning is uh, come back and start asking me questions. But I'll leave that up to you. Which do you, which you want to do? I want to come back and ask you questions. I'm going to interview you. I did a lot of talking just now. Okay. You know. All right. Well, I'm definitely going to need another drink for Bad that one. Drink. So uh, let's take a break and uh, 
I'll light this fire back up because I'm getting a little chilly. Okay. And we'll come back. Good? All right. All right, Michael, we are back. And All so right. I've opened the fire out because I was freezing my ass off. So we got some <laughs> ambiance going on. You know, we can hold hands if you want. But you want to, we talked about, you know, you were going to ask me some questions. But first off, we want to, I want to talk about a little bit of your philosophy that we were talking about on the break. Because I talked a lot just now. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole long story, yeah. you know, with all the, I bet I've done nearly 9,000 gigs, probably, sure. you know, yeah. it's a lot. I've been very lucky. Um, But I th think it all goes back to coaching and, and figures in your life that, you know, may not have been around very long, but they said or did something and put you in a position to do well. Yeah. Um, and obviously I'm not a baseball coach, but there have been baseball coaches that um, had a, you know, profound effect. It, it was just a, a one-time thing that happened. I remember it. And uh, as you go uh, through a music career, and I guess you call it a career, I've been playing a lot you know, for a really long time, and it's fun. It's great, and I don't want it to end, really. Uh, but as you go along, you have to challenge yourself and find ways to be the best bandmate that you can be. And it goes back to, I like being in situations that last a really long time. So I think, you know, going from band to band to band is just not going to help you. Mm. And you're going to miss stuff as a bass player. No, yeah. oh, I'm speaking just as a bass player. I'm sure it has to do with all musicians, right? I would think. Well, I think, you know, um, the guitar player, singer guys kind of do what they want. You know, uh, they're the ones that are pulling this creative stuff out of the sky, you know, and, and we're fortunate that Mike likes to have his guys around to help him with that, whether it's recording it or bouncing ideas off or going playing gigs or, or whatever. But there are a lot of guitar players who just go from thing to thing to thing to thing. And that's how they get their creative part out. So I tend to gravitate towards, you know, being in a long-term relationship because it's got challenges, mm -hmm. you know, it definitely has challenges. And, you know, we were talking earlier about Dwayne being the new person in the band and it's a shock to the system a little bit because his genre is so different than five, what five o'clock Charlie is known for, but it works because of the respect we have for each other. And we all know how to massage this thing to get it to work and get each guy comfortable. You know, I say each guy, I mean, Dwayne and Mike have to get it kind of worked out no. for it to work. And, uh, you know, Billy and I are there to support the endeavor really. Mm. It's a lot to think about, you yeah. know, and I, you know, I don't do anything else. I don't <laughs> sing. I don't, you know, I'm back there playing and observing, you know, trying to. And staring at people. In and the staring audience. at people in the audience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I may talk to that guy five years from now. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right. You ready to do this? Yeah. Let's do it. My turn. Yeah. Let's make it your turn. Okay. All right. Your final question. What is it? My final question. Okay, my final question is if you could do anything different in your life up to this point, what would it be? And what would you think that those impacts would have been if you'd done it different? Just one thing. You weren't ready for that one. Mm -mm. We can take another pause. <laughs> no, I... Uh, so I think that I would not have put off uh, getting a master's degree. Mm. I always wanted to do that and I never did it. And it was sort of a wanted to do it because to see if I could do it. Yeah. And there is time, I suppose, but that was always one thing I felt like that I didn't attack as hard as I probably should have, you know, and I think that being a musician is great there is a sense of arrested development that comes along with that. When you're solely focused on one thing, like I was, that uh, things that are obvious and 
growing up and mature type things that happen to most normal people don't come easy to somebody that's really focused. And uh, you do stupid stuff to people. Mm. I know I have. Yeah. And uh, I hate that. Being a dick all those years. Yeah, all those years. No, that was my good years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you develop so you know athletes and race car drivers and stuff like that. You know, think they uh, it, it seems great, right? But at the same time, you know, when COVID hit, I wasn't playing at all, and I got a regular job, and I was like, "Dang, it's kind of cool, actually." Mm. So I evaluate what I plan to do for the next year every year and I uh, have decided to go full blast again in 2024 so the guys in the band are hearing from me all the time about hey we got to fill the calendar up got to fill the calendar up yeah. so uh, that's my decision for this year and I do this every year and decide if I'm going to do it again because it's going to be like baseball for me it's going to be over when I decide it's not going to happen anymore it's not going to happen anymore no. it's going to be clean because mm. baseball was I never played again. I didn't play intramurals. I didn't play softball. When you're done, you're done. I'm done. Yeah. The highest level I could get to. And I think bass playing is going to be like that. I don't play bass at home. I listen a lot. Listen to a lot of stuff. Um, probably two or three hours of music a night. Try to really listen to it. Yeah. And I'm not a good producer or anything but in the five o'clock charlie situation when they ask me what i think i have these albums that i've listened to to draw upon and relate that yeah. and yeah. uh you know mike did a solo the other night that uh you know we'd had a we've struggled in the studio in the past <clears throat> and had some uh really big disagreements about where something was headed and we only now it all resolved and the album turned out good, but we couldn't talk each other's language. Well, this last time that we could go tonight, we had a brief conversation about this upcoming solo that he was going to do. And we talked about it for a second and then he nailed it. I was like, wow, okay. Mm. Maybe we're growing up here a little yeah. bit. <laughs> mm. It's good stuff. Yeah. All right, man. We're going to end this here. I appreciate you coming, and uh, like I said, part two maybe next year sometime. Next year or so, <laughs> thanks for coming, man. Yeah, and man. Uh, like I said, we'll start this up again. Okay, All right, bye. Thanks. Yeah.